let's have our disagreements, let's have our arguments, uh, l- let's follow some some kind of principles and guidelines that make them productive and interesting and even enjoyable, you know, um, rather than just shutting them. How are you doing? What's going on? So what's what's your day like? What's happening? Uh it's fine. We we had um a house was our house was, was breached by a storm um shit about 10 days ago uh, and we're still kind of dealing with that. Uh yeah. so the the front part of the house is is not in a good state. Oh shit. Where are you? Uh I'm in Walthamstow. I'm in the the wilds of uh of northeast London. Tottenham, near Spurs. Yeah, yeah. But there's no hiding from global warming, man. So um yeah, apart from that, we're fine. I'm sorry to hear about that. That's shitty. God, it's, I didn't know that it was it was that bad up in London. I know West Germany has been awful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just like really violent rain. Uh mm for for one evening um and that that was that was enough to do some damage our school has been flooded like seriously <gasps> flooded primary school oh. for our kids um so they've just had a year dealing with the pandemic and now suddenly it's like oh now we've got to work incredibly hard to get the school ready for september oh, so um yeah it's tough tough times anyway for world. us it's it's just it's it's a inconvenience but it's not it's not disaster yeah okay well i hope it yeah i hope it all ends up okay um so let's get on to arguments let's have some arguments um yeah it's better to have argue i mean this is the crux of your book isn't it conflicted it is better to have arguments tell us a bit about the book and just to start with you know basic intro and 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 why it is better sometimes to have arguments yeah the book is about how to have better arguments right um more productive, more insightful, more creative um, arguments, arguments that strengthen relationships um, in the end, you know, rather than undermining them or harming them. It actually started out with me thinking, okay, uh, there seems to be a lot of toxic, terrible arguments in the discourse at the moment. And maybe I need to write a book which is about how to avoid all these arguments and just get along with each other. And then I changed my mind. The more I thought about it, the more I researched it. And I came to see the problem almost as the opposite, which is partly because we see these toxic arguments, they're so visible now, we avoid them, right, in our lives as much as possible. Most of us are somewhat conflict avoidant already. Some of us, I'm particularly conflict avoidant. Um, And actually, having looked into it, I came to think, you know, that is the real cost to us as individuals and also as as societies, is we're actually becoming so wary of it and so scared of it for all sorts of reasons um, that we're actually just not having our arguments properly. We're not having our disagreements out in the open um and that is making us well there's several problems with it but one of this is making us collectively dumber um and uh because that's what happens when when people don't argue that they, they, they just make they think collectively uh, uh worse um and it's alienating us from each other if you don't have your arguments out the disagreements don't go away they just sort of become submerged into passive aggression and and, and all sorts of different uh, toxic, toxicity. So, um, so yeah, so, so the mission of the book really is, and, and my kind of mission now really is to, is to say, look, let's have our disagreements. Let's have our arguments. But let's follow some, some kind of principles and guidelines that make them productive and interesting and even enjoyable you know um rather than just shutting them okay so i agree with you and i i'm also i avoid arguments as well and i find it very awkward i think that's why you and i had a bit of a hello how's the weather conversation i think we i guess there were sort of courteousness things going on between us that maybe some people i can say i can see straight away when they answer on the on the podcast hello they're down for business 
and those people are probably better at sort of being straight and arguing. Um, what, one, one of the biggest concerns I have about this podcast is that it's very difficult to have people on and ever disagree with what the person says. And that's no good as a journalist if I'm having people on and I very rarely ever say to someone, wait, what are you talking about? That's not right or something like that. What advice would you have for me on the, on the, as a podcaster or journalist interviewer? This is a good question, actually. I hadn't thought about that. I, I think in as an interviewer or a podcaster, sometimes it's not important for you to disagree. Um, it, it, sometimes, you even when you do, so, so sometimes you're just trying to draw that person out and let them say as much as possible. And if you kind of jump in and say, oh, well, I disagree, you might actually shut them up or, or you know, it might sort of divert the conversation from... Uh, so sometimes you kind of just want that person to to talk, right? Um, yeah. Even or especially when they're saying things that you you think are disagreeable. Um, but uh, more generally, I think if you're going to do it, then the best thing to do is to emphasize the fact that you respect them and you or, or and or you like them. Um, you need to kind of boost them up a bit before you get to the disagreement. This is something I talk about a lot about in the book, right? Um, disagreements go badly and they can go badly very quickly when the, when somebody or both people feel threatened in some way, they feel they're being attacked as a person and you can cope with that. You can do something about that, right? In a couple of ways. One is just looking to yourself and thinking, well, you know, just because this person is disagreeing with me or we're in a tense conversation now, um, I, I'm going to control my own sense of insecurity, but you can also help kind of manage the other person's insecurity. You can try and lower their defenses and it might be just flattering them, you know, or it might be just saying, I agree with you on this, right? We're in agreement here, but I do have a question about this, right? So th there are lots of different ways to do it, but you're, you're basically trying to just put the relationship, even if it's just in the moment, on a more secure footing before you get into that tough bit. And that just relaxes them a little bit and enables them to speak more freely. The worst thing that can happen is that the disagreement turns into a status battle, some sort of a struggle for dominance. Right. It's interesting because, yeah, next week I've got Will Storr on the status game. He's just written uh, about... Ah status uh and i suppose that's a huge i mean that the books really do overlap a lot uh, i've been reading both of them the last week and it is really interesting i suppose would you would you say it's yeah. uh about yeah like as you say identity and we we seem to link our um uh, our ideologies and if somebody attacks our ideologies they seem to be attacking us um is, is that what you think it is it's just we take these things so personally they become part of us yeah. And I mean, so, and it doesn't have to be an ideology, right? It can be just, you can be arguing with your partner about who spends too much money or who should do more of the housework. And the argument is always sort of bound up with your feelings about each other. Right. So, so communication scientists will, will say that there are a couple of different levels. There's two kind of fundamental levels going on in any conversation. One of them is the content level, and the other one is the relationship level. The content level is the thing that we are talking about, right? That taking out the trash or um, yeah, uh, politics or whatever it is. So we're discussing this thing, but always underneath at a kind of unarticulated level, there is this relationship conversation going on, which is about what you think about me and what I think about you, whether or not you're giving me enough respect and and, and vice versa or enough affection. And until that relationship level is kind of settled, the, the content level just gets disrupted, right? Um, and just kind of goes off the rails. Um, and so you, you really kind of have to settle that level. And some people are just completely oblivious to it. <laughs> you, you know, you will sometimes find yourself in a conversation, and depends which side you're on, but sometimes you'll be thinking, why is that person behaving so emotionally irrationally? I mean, we're just discussing tax policy. It's ridiculous. And it might be because that person just doesn't feel like maybe they feel patronized or condescended by you, right? You're trying, or you're trying to 
push them around in some in some way and you have to address that first before you can get back up to the to the content level but when the content level when the relationship level is is more settled you can really vigorously get into a really kind of fruitful disagreement at the at the content level yeah so so i think um just your, your question you mentioned identity and i think increasingly we associate these positions with a kind of broader identity right um i'm a, a feminist or a socialist or uh i'm a liberal or whatever. and so so you experience every disagreement with what you're saying as an attack on me and people like me and that actually does make it a lot harder because you you've always in disagreement at the relationship level and you can't really get up to the the content level and talk about the thing that you're meant to be talking about I, I like what you're saying about the the status and the, the feeling of condescending someone because my my brother is younger than me he gets wound up so quickly and so angry uh, in arguments that we have just just the smallest things and he can get very angry and I started to realize that a big part of that was that I was just such a condescending bastard and that can't have helped to always be the younger brother and to always have this condescending older guy who thinks he's you know and as soon as I've stopped sort of being as condescending I'm trying anyway he's also ca stayed calmer in in any debates we have and we can see you know a, a more common ground yeah it's funny uh, it totally makes sense and um you could see you see these parallels in in family relationships and in broader social dynamics yeah so when they do studies of couples and, and marital couples and how they argue you, you might not be surprised to learn that it's often women who are more attuned to that relationship level than men, right? So, so men are often kind of thinking, oh my goodness, why is she getting so upset? <laughs> We're just talking about this thing. Um, and, uh, and the women are, are saying, yeah, but you're, you're, you're really talking down to me. You're annoying me. You're patronizing. Um, you, you're not, you don't, you haven't noticed how much I've been doing. Um, so you're not giving me enough kind of, respect and so on and this is not something that's hardwired into us right so so actually in the lab when they when they pay the men to pay more attention to the relationship level the men are perfectly capable of it <laughs> yeah it's just that they they don't have the incentive because they're usually kind of on the on the uh, uh on the other side of a, of a power relationship same with you and your brother right is yeah. that when when you kind of make yourself do it you, you you can do it but but you know you hadn't kind of really thought about it as much up until then we are selfish bastards um <laughs> this ties in with i think what you were saying about the difference between high context and low context culture what what do they mean yeah so this is a distinction drawn from anthropology um, and it's usually used there to talk about differences between national cultures or, or regional cultures, although it actually applies really, you know, in, be, between people inside the same country. It, it applies every, at every level, but, but let's talk about it in terms of regional cultures because it, it's kind of helpful. So high context culture is one where the context in, in which you're having a debate or a discussion does a lot of the communication for you. You don't actually have to say that much explicitly for the people in the room to understand what you mean. So in global terms, um, Asian countries, China, you know, tend to be more high context communication, China or Japan. Um, and you'll see this, you know, when you see studies of cross-cultural communication with, with businessmen and so on, they'll say, you know, you, you, you don't have to communicate directly because the people in the room are actually very attuned to the, the hierarchy. Everyone's uh, kind of knows what everyone means. Communication is very oblique. It's quite minimal. People don't actually say that much. Um, and then uh, you leave the room. And if you're inside that culture, people understand what's taken place. Outsiders to it are often quite baffled, they didn't, didn't understand. So a low context culture is the opposite, right? You've got people from many different backgrounds. You can't rely on norms or traditions to, to, to some extent to know. So everyone is expected to talk and articulate and express themselves more directly, more forcibly, more volubly. And, uh, one consequence of that is that there's more opportunity for conflict because you suddenly hear everyone speaking their mind and you realize that they'll think different things from you um, and you can quickly get into arguments. In a high context culture like Japan or China, direct disagreement is really kind of frowned upon and seen as quite gauche or, you know, 
very awkward indeed. Um, in a low context culture, it's more kind of expected. It's not always easy, but it's, it's kind of more expected. Now, the, I just think this is really interesting because if you actually look at the movement of the whole, where the whole world is going, um, we're all becoming more low context because we, we're, we're living in more diverse uh, environments, you know, in, in, in cities, uh, there's much more immigration. You're, you're always kind of around people or increasingly you're around people from many different backgrounds, gender and religion and culture and so on. And then above all, the internet is just is relentlessly low context. Um, it's low context in, in its kind of the incredible cacophony of different voices that you get. And also because also because you're often communicating with people where you 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 don't know who they are, really, you know, or or, or you can't see them, you can't feel them. You're often just communicating with them in a little box, right? With with text. Um, there's this emphasis on language, which again in a high context culture, language is not so important. It's more to do with you know who you are and who's in the room. Um, so we're we're now living in this increasingly low context world, and that means there's just a lot more potential for conflict and 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 sort of direct confrontation. And yet we are not remotely prepared for it, right? That neither evolution nor culture has prepared for us for this for this moment in history. We spent most of our lives, you know, looking at the great span of, of human existence and civilization, we spent most of our lives in fairly high context cultures, right? Usually been around people from your own culture who believed the same in the same gods or God as you did. And, uh, and then the other, you, you kind of fought with outsiders now and again, and that was it. Um, I'm generalizing, but that's basically the, the direction of human history. And now we're in this place where suddenly anybody can talk to anybody at, at any time. You can all impulsively express your opinion about anything and publicize and send it to thousands or millions of people. And we're just not prepared for it. So I, you know, I think we've got to learn some, some coping me mechanisms and that's kind of part of what the book is about. I guess language was used to, to enforce high context um, cultures back in the day. And still, if you look at France with their vous and tu, you know, vous for, you know, as an older person, you can speak to them with more courteous language. I'm trying to think where Germany would rank on yeah. the sort of high context, because that's where I am now. And I find them really difficult to work out and stuff. Would that, they, they might not tell me what they're thinking. I suppose that would make them a high, a high context culture. Yeah, I don't know what, what the... Um the people who study this would say, but it feels, uh, I, I suspect it would be quite high context, a bit more reliance on, on tradition and norms, a bit more respect for hierarchy, a little bit more deference than uh, countries like uh, the UK and, and the US. Um, and it's not that one of these ways of, of living is better than the other, you know, there are just pluses and drawbacks to both, but generally, the movement is towards the low context, and I'm, you know, I'm sure, you know, Germany is moving in that direction too. And one of the interesting things about Germany is they've actually been quite slow to adopt to social media. I don't know if this is still true, but certainly a few years ago, there's very kind of relatively low penetration of um, of social media. So they've they're, they're sort of resisting it, but they will be swept along <laughs> eventually. <laughs> No, no doubt. Be. Yeah, they will, and I think they are now. And they use different ones as well. They're they're really into. They're not so much into the WhatsApp and and Facebook, and then they'll use. Um, I can't even remember what they're called now. There's a few other ones they use. Oh, I right, right. Yeah, I can't think. There's a it's a blue one, but I don't remember what it's called. But they're they're all into that. Um, and I suppose a lot a lot of this sudden, as you say, this sudden movement into really low context, and I suppose almost no context that what you described is like all you know is there's a box and you're writing to them. There's no outside context as to the social norms and the expectations there started with the dawn of the internet. And you say in, in the you talk in the book about how people and I didn't realize this, people thought the internet would make us agree more and sort of come together rather than create this crazy angry disagreement you know conflict that we have now yeah i mean it was a it was a lovely dream um, but it was absolutely part of the mission of the early internet pioneers and then also the kind of second generation so so people like mark zuckerberg um who believed and you know for all i know he still does believe that eventually this will all work out that that actually by connecting more and more people to more and more people giving us more chance to communicate, we will just naturally become closer to each other. We'll be able to work out 
all our differences will understand each other a lot better um and of course it hasn't worked out like that <laughs> no Lots i mean that sounds reasons. like a brave new brave new world scenario though doesn't it it doesn't sound uh conducive to a, a working and progressive society which I, I suppose you do make that point as to why we need arguments and why arguments are important in the book and another really important uh, interesting thing i thought i think i think the general consensus among most the listeners and me like lay people like myself would be you know, oh, the problem with the internet uh, is the echo chambers. We're all in our echo chambers. But you posit that that's not at all true. Yeah, I mean, it's the, the, the problem with the internet is that it just destroys our echo chambers. Um, I grew up in a household, probably not unlike a lot of people, where we got one newspaper every day and we watched the BBC News in the evening and that was about it in, in terms of our kind of information ecosystem. Um, now that is a filter bubble, right? Um, and now I just read, you know, hundreds of opinions every day from all sorts of different people from all sorts of different backgrounds. Many of them are hugely annoying and offensive and just kind of triggering. Um, and I think that experience is quite kind of representative right you you're suddenly getting exposure to people from way outside your own social milieu and and, and social bubble um and that has has a couple of, of of effects one is it kind of drives you in towards the people that you do agree with and that you do trust and go well these are my people and it, it, it kind of drives you away from the other because you're not getting much sense again like we were saying you're not getting much sense of context or depth of understanding of what the other side is saying you're just seeing these opinions kind of burst out of nowhere um and the fact is you don't go around in your everyday real life existence being morally outraged by things <laughs> no. um you you but that's what we get on social media and there've been actually studies done on this you know, people have sort of tracked people and, and worked out how many times they see something or hear something in their actual lives where they are kind of morally outraged. And it's it's pretty rare. Yeah. But on social media, it's like, you know, 20 times a day. Um, so, again, it's just another thing that we're just having to adjust to very quickly because this is all, all happened very fast. It's so different, isn't it? The kinds of things. I mean, I got in an argument with my neighbour yesterday because he was playing his music too loud. But it's not really a moral judgment so much as you're playing music loud and it's annoying me. I'm, I'm just trying to think about ever getting morally outraged by someone in real life. I can't think of any real examples. But then as, as soon as I open up Twitter, yeah, a, a million <laughs> things. And you talk about, uh, write about moralizing language, which is, I suppose, quite, is patronizing to, to people on the other side of it. And it's also presumptuous about where morality lies. I find myself, even reading the, the term moralizing language, uh, I found myself going, yes, that's a great term for it. I hate people who use moralizing. And I found myself moralizing about people who use moralizing language. And I thought, no, stop it. Stop moralizing. Why do we use all this moralizing language? Yeah, I mean... <laughs> The ninety percent of uh, internet of, of Twitter seems to be uh, these people are worse than me, mm. you know, or or, the, or this person is is worse than me in some way. Um, uh, well, you know, maybe fifty percent of it is these people are morally worse than me. The other fifty percent is these people are stupider than me. It's one of the two, but that is basically a lot of like I'm not as bad as these people. I'm better than these people. Again, it goes back to this low, low context thing. You're just having to make a lot of quick judgments about a, a diverse array of, of of opinions. A lot of them very annoying, very alien, very strange to you. And the easiest way to to deal with it is to say, well, this person is bad or stupid. I don't have to think about it. It's almost like an energy saving de device, right? We are, you know, psychologists mm -hmm. talk about us as cognitive misers, um, and what they mean by that is that the the, our brains are always looking for shortcuts to save energy. Right? The, the brain consumes huge amount of energy relative to, to the body. Um, and any way that we can kind of save energy, we, we, we will. One of the ways we save energy, I think, is, is just by dismissing somebody who has a view that we find strange or, 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 or disagreeable. We, we'll instinctively look for ways to go, 
oh, that they're saying that because they're evil or they're saying that because they're thick. That just saves us the energy of having to think about the point of view that, that we're hearing. Um, and, you know, and also you know, sometimes it is true. Sometimes that person is <laughs> yeah. evil or thick, whatever. Um, and the, the, the problem with the advice that you sometimes hear people say, well, you know, you, you should curate your, your information ecosystem or your, your Twitter feed to, to, to have people who disagree with you in it, right? You should, you should be hearing from more people from the other side. So then what people do is they follow, I don't know, Piers Morgan or Toby Young or someone like that. Mm. And, and, then, and then Toby Young is kind of crashing in with these like deliberately provocative <laughs> things every day. And you're like, oh my God, these people are awful. <laughs> I'm so right. They really are awful. <laughs> um, and, you, you know, and so it just kind of reinforces um, the effect whereas the, the 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 thing that you should do you know and it's hard because it's not always possible is f track down and cherish people that you like who disagree with you uh, about politics or whatever it is it, it's some you need some combination of personal respect and affection for somebody and them having very different views from you you know when you find people like that, they're, they're very valuable because because that relationship, again, that relationship level, it, it opens up a space for you to engage with them and to listen to them at the at the content level. That's really interesting, and and sometimes I guess that's the hardest thing to do because we see how, uh, for example, on the left, it feels like the left's biggest enemy is the slightly different left. Um, I, I, of course, there are the Toby Youngs and the Katie Hopkins of this world, but most people sort of ignore them because you think, well, they're, I don't care about them. They're ridiculous. Um, and you, you, it, I guess because we feel uh, threatened by those who have uh, closer to us and might move us away. I don't know. I mean, you talk about the, the threat state and the challenge state. Would that apply to, to that kind of thing? Yeah, that's a great uh, uh, point to bring up because so th this is actually a, a distinction from uh, sports psychology, where they're, they're, they're studying the effect of nerves and, and pressure on performance. And they, they use this distinction where they say, if the athlete is in uh, a, a challenge state, they, they're feeling a little bit nervous, but actually the nerves kind of put them into a higher performance than they would be a uh, higher state of performance than they would be if they were just feeling completely calm, right? Um, the, the the heart beats faster, but it's also more efficient. Um, so you're producing more, more energy. Um, or oh, you're using energy more efficiently. Um, and then a, a, a threat state is when that those nerves kind of spike and go uh, out of performance state. And actually, you start feeling a bit scared by the challenge ahead of you and and everything in your body just goes I'm, i need to defend myself from from this threat of, of whatever's about to happen to me humiliation or whatever it is and your uh, heartbeat beats very fast and very inefficiently and you know you get that kind of weird sense of high excitement and, and kind of uh, you feel like you're mired in, in 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 something as well you know you can't kind of escape it um and i i think this is really helpful for thinking about the kind of feeling you want to have in a good disagreement. Like if you're having a really good vigorous disagreement, there should be some challenge, right? I don't think it should be completely calm or academic, or it could be, or it probably just won't be as interesting. Um, so I think a challenge state is the right state to be in, but you've got to be careful it doesn't tip over into threat state. Once you're into threat state, you, and again, this is, people have looked at this in terms of debates, you have a much greater tendency to hang on to your first position in an argument. So whatever the first position is, you go, oh, I'm just sticking to that, I'm sticking to that because I feel threatened. And I feel that if I change it, if I back down in any sense at all, I'm gonna be crushed. And so if two people are in a threat state or more, that's all, you, all you're getting is this kind of butting of heads. And they're both trying to kind of stick to their, to their opening position and nobody, moves and so no progress is made it's so hard though because you know if i'm thinking of 
somebody I don't know I, I try not to have such strong opinions about anyone because I like to think of myself anyway as some sort of center grounded person or whatever but if I meet somebody and they're introduced as like oh yeah he's this big Jeremy Corbyn follower for, for Americans that's a very left wing uh, former le- labor leader I know that I'm suddenly I'm feeling threat the threat thing is happening it's not the challenge I'm feeling threatened I and I, and I don't want to I want to engage in real debate with this person and maybe see their point of view how how could i overcome is there a way to overcome that threat it's so intrinsic it feels well i i do think that recognizing it when it's happening just helps a little bit right so so you know you actually feel yourself you were pointing to your chest when you did that you you can feel yourself tightening right and and you are there's a kind of physiological effect and and just being a little bit aware of that and saying well there's a reason this is happening and, and actually you know i have a choice about how to deal with it and i can breathe and so on <laughs> I, I i you know i i think does help a little yeah. bit uh, and then also just thinking well how do i get myself out of this mode and i think it's what you you just touched on actually which is curiosity well is is one way it will kind of get into get, getting into a more curious mindset is going to help you is it's a kind of opposition between um uh kind of judgment and curiosity almost suspending putting your judgment aside for a little bit and saying well look i may not agree with this person i'm pretty sure i'm not going to become a corbynite overnight but um and, but i can at the very least be interested in how they came to hold the views that they have right um, so let's use maybe a little a less um, a politically kind of like contentious example. You know, if you're talking to someone who's like a QAnon follower, maybe that is politically contentious, whatever. But you know, I'm talking about someone who's like right at the other, you know, the yeah, extreme yeah. end of the spectrum of views. And you think, well, what's the point? You know, we're going to have a horrible argument here. The, well, the least you can do if you are having this conversation, you may as well have it, is to say, well, I can actually be interested in how they come... I can learn about why they think that, right? Uh, and I'm not going to be, you know, converted by the end of it. I think some of the part of the reason that people don't do that is that they feel at some level like they might just be converted. It's a bit <laughs> like that classic fear that heterosexuals have of, of yes. talking to a gay man. And so maybe he'll turn me gay. You know, for one thing, if they turn you gay, that's fine. <laughs> you know, um, for another thing, they're not going to turn you gay. Um, no. And I think, um, uh, you know, it's, that's how we should think about, you know, talking to people with whom we disagree. <laughs> I feel less threat talking to somebody who's that extreme, you know, and that's that thing again, isn't it? So the reason Corbyn boils my blood a little right. bit more than, you know, some right wing dictator is because I don't know anybody who would be a friend of mine or whatever, who's just a big fan of this right wing dictator Whereas a lot of friends of mine and probably people listening to this podcast are very big, you know, in the Corbyn camp and they're totally entitled to be. So I think it's that threat again, isn't it? Yeah, that's interesting. So yeah, yeah. So maybe it's like, you almost have to be open to them persuading you that you are wrong and that's yeah. okay. You know, so, so maybe they will make me think, uh, be more sympathetic to, to Corbyn or Corbynite views by the end of this conversation. That's not the worst thing in the world. I, you know, I, I, I'll have shifted yeah. a little in my <laughs> views, but, you know, <laughs> let's see I how know. it goes. I think you're, you're spot on about that fear of actually being converted. You know, it's that thing. I'm, I'm having a debate yeah. with somebody, but this and and I don't think this is just me. I think this is very common. To, it's universal, isn't it? You don't really want to be convinced. We don't want to lose the argument. It feels a bit like a sport. And that goes back to there was, there was uh, in your book, of course, we talk uh, you talk about um, Socrates and how arguing was really like a sport. And are we losing that that art, or is it coming back? We we we've maybe lost sight of. The, the idea that it's through argument that we can come to, we, we just think better in argument, right? We're actually, and I talk about the sort of evolutionary background to this in the book, but we're really designed to do our thinking interactively with other people. That's something that Socrates understood. Part of the reason Socrates didn't write anything down. You know, so writing was around at his time uh, but it was a bit like the iphone or something it was a, a, a <laughs> relatively new technology that people you know older people had views on That's such a funny thought <laughs> and uh, I love, yeah I love that. And socrates was like no i don't know i don't like this writing <laughs> and and 
part of the reason that he didn't like it was that it, it couldn't talk back to him. You know, you would just write down and a view and that would be it. Whereas he did his thinking in dialogue with others and he wanted to kind of bounce off other people all, all, all the time. And we, we became, in the subsequent few thousand years, uh, we became a, a little more focused on individuals thinking, right? So now if you think about the kind of archetypal thinker, you would say you know, it's, it's like Rodin's sculpture. It's a, a man, it usually is a man. Mm. Is that the fist on his chin? Is With that, a, is that yeah, that one? yeah. Fist on the chin or you know, hand on brow and, and just sort <laughs> of lost in, in deep in deep thoughts. Um, but actually we do our best thinking in in groups um, a lot of the time and in, in probably most of the time on average, right? It, it's in groups that we kind of, we can try out our opinions and our ideas and we can quickly see if they are weak arguments or strong arguments. We get quick feedback and we kind of move at a much greater pace. Um, and you see this institutionalized at the level of the scientific method, right? The scientific method is really about making uh, scientific investigation a communal process. People have hypotheses and then they publish them and then other people review them and try and knock them down. And the strongest ones survive until they get knocked down and replaced by, by another one. That's kind of how it should work. Um, we just become a little bit more obsessed with with individual things, and therefore, when you be, when when it becomes about the individual, it often becomes about these zero sum battles where I, I've I have this argument, and you know I, I've thought about this, and now I need to to just win and crush and, and humiliate, and that makes us a little bit less willing to just let go of the rope a bit, a little bit, and just be a little bit looser in our in our thinking. Um, uh, admitting the possibility that maybe we'll change our mind in this conversation. What does zero sum mean again? Where does that come from? Yeah, so um, it comes from game theory, mathematical game theory. But it, it basically means a, any game in which one person wins and, and one person loses. Whereas a non-zero sum game is a game where you play and both parties come away uh, better off. In, in some sense. You know what, what was really interesting? So, I mean, in, in terms of that, you know, we should argue uh, in order to develop things and, and you know, uh, was the story of the Wright brothers, which was just uh, a fascinating read. Could you tell me a bit about the way that they, um, what did they, they didn't discover, invented the plane? <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's probably some expert who would say that's not quite what they did but i think basically yeah they invented the plane <laughs> um and what what's remarkable about it is because i hadn't realized this right um this is around the the turn of the the 19th 20th century early 20th century you had lots of incredibly clever and um, well-resourced people working on this problem at the same time, right? It's one of those breakthroughs where lots of people were close to it. Um, and then and then one person got out ahead or two people in this case. Um, and most of these people were uh, scientists and engineers and highly qualified people working at universities or funded by big corporations. And yet the people who cracked it were, were two guys who ran a bike shop in a small town in Ohio, wow. didn't have any educational credentials at all. Um, and that I just find, you know, absolutely astonishing. And a big part of the reason that they were able to, I mean, they're obviously very bright, but a big part of the reason that they were able to get there so fast was the way that they worked together. And the, work, the way they worked together was through argument. They uh, they were vigorous debaters and arguers, and they would get up every day and basically um, disagree with each other about what to do. <laughs> and if you walked past, you know, people who walked past their their bike shop would hear these kind of arguments spilling out in into the street. And if you didn't know them, you would think, "Oh my goodness, sounds like they're having a terrible row." But those who did know them really well knew that this was just how they interacted, and, and that actually. They loved each other. They're very close to each other, stayed close th throughout their whole lives. But they'd just grown up in this family culture because their father kind of introduced them to this way of talking and, and thinking, which was, 
you put your point of view, I'll put mine and we'll really, really go at it. And that just meant that they they moved intellectually, you know, much faster than than anyone else because that's one of the things disagreement does it just kind of speeds up the thinking process because you're throwing out these arguments and you're getting them knocked down very quickly then you have to find a stronger one and they really enjoyed it it was they would get disappointed if if they met someone and they disagreed with them and the other person just backed down and said you're right they would say hey come on we, we gotta have a scrap you know that that was kind of fun for them right um and no we're not no we're not all going to be like the Wright brothers, right? They're very unusual, but I think we can take a little bit of that spirit. Um, you know, there, it wasn't something that they that stressed them out. It was something they valued and enjoyed. Um, and of course, it, it had amazing results. Could those kinds of arguments um, help with, I mean, we, we've covered it a little bit, but couples will, uh, couples who argue, do they do as, as well as couples who don't argue and vice versa? Yeah, this is super interesting because for relationship scientists, for a long time, they, since the field started really kind of in the post-war years, they assumed that the couples who split up or had bad marriages were the ones who were arguing all the time because they did tend to argue a lot, right? Mm. But then they started doing these studies where they would film couples discussing some contentious issue in the relationship in a lab, see how they argued, right? What their style was or how they debated. And then they would track their progress for, for several months or years afterwards and see how they got along and to their surprise they actually found the couples who were quickest to rise to quite heated arguments and who really kind of got into it were actually the ones who were more likely to stay together more likely to be fulfilled and happy in their in their marriage and more likely to solve their problems than the ones who sat and discussed everything very calmly and sort of unemotionally um, and the reason for it seems to be that when, when you're arguing, you're learning about the other person. So one psychologist said to me, conflict is information, right? Because in an argument, you're letting the veil of decorum or politeness or passivity just slip a little. You're really kind of bearing your soul a little, right? you, you, you're, you're showing what you really care about. Like when you were arguing with your brother, you suddenly quickly find out what your, what your brother really cares about. Um, and that kind of updates your model of your partner and it, it, it keeps you close to them effectively because you it's very easy to just assume you know what your partner thinks and, and cares about, particularly in a long marriage. And the couples who are have fairly frequent, usually quite low stakes, but fairly frequent arguments about things are constantly kind of updating themselves on, on, on what the other thinks and feels. That was something I found um, almost quite sad, actually, was that we uh, we have this image that we create of, of our partner or anyone that we know uh, in the first few years. And often we miss, I suppose, if we're not constantly updating it, as you say, um, we just we just remain thinking of them as they once were, even if they've moved on and they've become a completely different person. And then I guess you have couples who 20, 30 years later realize that they're not the same people like when when did that happen but it's been happening for decades um so i guess is it just a case of uh constantly reminding yourself to reevaluate the situation so yeah they the couples couples who uh, stay together a long time actually get worse progressively at, at reading each other's minds at sort of empathetic <laughs> mind reading which is which is interesting yeah because they they, they yeah. kind of stick with a the model that they built in the first couple of years which is very efficient right you get to know exactly everything that your partner says or does you you understand at a deeper level which is great but then everyone changes over time right even in a couple where you you're, you're still having different experiences and reactions in, in different ways um and unless you pay close attention to how your partner is changing um then you can drift apart and and arguments are actually a pretty efficient way of giving you a kind of uh, you know, a news message on what's going on in your partner's mind and, and your partner's heart. Um, now, I'm sure there are other methods, but the thing is that, that if you try and rationally sit down and, you know, once a week or once a month and say, well, tell me what you're thinking and feeling, you know, <laughs> it, it's not going to work as well as there's something about argument which kind of, you know, just just brings it out more, more authentically and, and more truthfully. Um now, obviously, like a, a couple which is who who are constantly arguing in a quite a, 
an unpleasant or, or vicious way, that's horrible, right? And it's it's no good for them, and it's no good for whoever's around, you know, their children or, or whatever. So it's not what I'm advocating. Uh, but I, I I think kind of not being afraid to air your differences, and and to do it so quite vigorously, is a good thing. And in fact, I've I've become more open to it in my marriage, and become more open to having arguments about things, which is kind of strong disagreements. I don't necessarily call them arguments. Um, it, it, even including in front of the children, instead of, you know, every time I have a disagreement with my wife about what to do at the weekend or whatever, or we go, uh, oh, let's take this, let's have this in a, at another time. As if, it, as if it's some sort of shameful thing to do in front of kids. Um, I'd, I'd rather have it out now so that the kids see that you can argue with each other and you still love each other. It's 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 not this kind of weird, uh, you know, aberration. It's part of part of life. That was actually going to be my next question about how researching this book has affected your own life and your family life and work life and stuff. I mean, do do you argue as well as now doing it in front of the children and stuff? You know, not proper arguments, of course, but do do you argue in a different way as well? Do you try other tips you've taken from your own research to to change how you are with your wife, for example? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, a lot. Um, it's made me just much more willing to have open disagreements, not with my wife, not just with my wife, but but with, you know, people at work or other friends and family. Um, because, well, I, I've learned for one thing that it's just healthier to do it that way that actually if you have a really strong feeling where you really strongly disagree on something yeah you you can keep it in and maybe you avoid a short-term discomfort but in the longer term it, 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 you just you're killing a little bit of that relationship i think you know you're just you're just alienating yourself a little bit from from the other person or the other people um and for another thing and of course you know a lot of this is in the book that there are things you can do to do to to make it go better and and for it not to be so stressful you know and just learning a few of these simple principles you know we talked about one or two of them you, you know trying to connect at some level trying to reassure the other person that you're not attacking them you're just disagreeing with them on this point right yeah um once you kind of learn this kind of approach it just takes a lot of the stress out of it and and you you kind of become more confident that okay we can do this and it's not going to go horribly off the rails these are the the nine rules and the golden rule that that are sort of i guess halfway through the book you, you go start to go into those um and i guess they're 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 important people people should get your book um we shouldn't tell them all the rules because uh, then they, they need to buy the book uh, and another another one i should mention is it just uh is teasing isn't it teasing is quite an important way that we've learned to to argue isn't it yeah, I mean, I'm really interested in teasing. I've always liked being teased and I've, I've always kind of regarded it almost as a sign of intimacy or maybe that's too strong a word, but there's often a point with people I know, or people I'm friends with or people I work with where they start to tease me about something and it feels like, or I can do the same to them. And it, but, and it starts to feel like you're closer somehow where you can start openly laughing at each other's foibles and quirks and so on. It's, it's really nice, but it's also just interesting socially because it's like a, it's a great form of feedback. It's a great form of, it's a great way to learn about what your foibles are, your quirks are and how you are different from the mean average of, you know, other people's behaviors in lots of different contexts. Cause it, it, rather than somebody coming along and saying, you know, you're really bad at this, um, it, it's somebody kind of letting you know that, but in a humorous and, and affectionate way. And of course, it can cross over into basically being mean or manipulative or whatever. But done right, it's I, I think it's actually a, a lovely form of uh, interaction. Nice headphones, mate. Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I feel, I'm just teasing you. I've got, I think we've got the same headphones and uh, yours are very nice. Um I want to move on to you. Just on a, you've got a Substack where you, uh, for people who don't know what Substack is, it's a sort of often a subscription based. It's a place where journalists can just write articles. One of the reasons I like your writing in particular is because um, I do find it frustrating how journalism is becoming very much like activism. And you wrote a really interesting piece recently 
um, about the woman in the park with her dog. Um, it, I'm, most people listening would have seen this. If you haven't, you can find it on online. It was a few months ago when a, a, a woman was... Well, you can explain it, actually, uh, if, if you'd like. Um, yeah, that, that article, I, I thought it was really fantastically written. Oh, thank you. I mean, so, oh, well, let me talk about the incident first. So, so the incident was um, a, a woman in Central Park she was filmed and this and then this this video went viral it was right in the wake of the george floyd uh video um and she was threatening to call the police on the man filming her who she described as an african-american man she was like i'm going to call the police and tell them an african-american man is threatening me not nice to say that. Not nice, and 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 it was it's pretty horrible video to watch. And the 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 guy filming it turned out to be a, a bird watcher. She had a dog with her with with her, and they'd been kind of arguing about whether or not the dog should be on a leash. Um, and this became a huge uh, story uh, as an example of uh, of racism. Um, and she was really kind of universally reviled and condemned and, and abused. She was fired from her job and and so on. Now, I hadn't really thought about that story much since then. Um, but then uh, there's a, a podcast came out recently um, from the ex New York Times writer called Barry Weiss. Um, and she uh, and a guy called Camille Foster um, and Camille Foster in particular did, did the reporting on this. He he got really interested in in this incident because he didn't think it had been reported in quite the right way. And when he looks into it, he actually turns up a whole load of interesting context, uh, which were, kind of changes your perception of what that video was showing you. So, so he actually kind of sh talks about and he finds evidence for what had happened just before. We, we see that video, which kind of makes you think, ah, well, I can understand a little bit more now why she was upset and, 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 and maybe she genuinely did feel threatened and, and I understand that a little bit more now. Um, and you learn a bit of more context about this kind of battles between dog watchers and or dog walkers and bird watchers and all sorts of things. Anyway, it, it doesn't kind of necessarily transform your view what you know, you don't suddenly think, oh, she's wonderful and he's terrible. But you do think, well, I we got a really simplified, simplistic kind of angels and demons versus a version of this narrative when the reality is a lot more nuanced and uh, and more interesting, actually. Um, now, th so so really, I, I would just say, listen to, to that podcast my my newsletter was about my the the post i wrote in my newsletter was about how that had made you made me think about this broader issue about the way these hot button stories are reported particularly when they involve viral videos you know you see a video and you think oh that's terrible it just triggers your very direct emotional response and you think that you're seeing reality feel you know unmediated well actually you're imposing always lots of cultural kind of stereotypes and preconceptions. Um, and you're also having the narrative shaped very forcefully and violently by, by social media. Um, and journalists, I think at that point, like journalists who work for the New York Times or The Guardian or whatever, should be the ones who dig underneath those kind of instant viral narratives and say, was it really like that? Is that really... What happened? Can we find out more information? And they don't always do that. I, and, I, and I think part of the reason they do that, they don't do that, is because they are, and perhaps increasingly, it's just swept up in the the moralism, the, the moralizing kind of narrative. They are also looking for good by good guys and bad guys. Um, and so I was just arguing that actually, journalists should not let themselves get caught up in that kind of hunting for uh, heroes and villains they should really be guided by their curiosity. Uh, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, you know, the way that, that curiosity is almost like the antidote to kind of instant simplistic judgments. Cause you're going, okay, actually I really want to understand why was she upset? Like she 
you know, was she just performing that distress? Was she faking it? Or was there maybe a real reason? And you kind of dig into it and you go, well, yeah, it's, it's complicated. And I want journalists to kind of complicate things and go, ah, OK, well, it wasn't quite like that. Look at this fact. Look at this piece of information instead of just repeating the, the, the social media narrative. So that was a very long answer to your question. No, it's a very interesting answer. And I think, I, I guess the issue is that they don't really have an incentive aside from their own dignity, I suppose, a journalist, to do that because the more sensationalist, the more hits and likes and things it will get. Well, the, in, the incentive is the opposite. Yeah, the, the, the incentive is to, to pile in behind the social media narrative and just amplify it because, uh, yeah, because they're so driven by clicks now but then there there is that but there's also another kind of incentive which is more like a kind of tribalistic one which is a a lot of these journalists are highly educated liberals who kind of think in the same way Um, and they are actually trying to kind of prove their moral and political credentials to their own side and that also kind of pushes them in that direction so um yeah i'm just sort of hoping that that, that they, they don't all get carried away by that and the other thing is also money isn't it i mean you used to hear i mean before my time as a journalist but you'd hear about the the kinds of investigations people would go on and it'd be sent by like rolling stone to do like a two-month long investigation and get thousands of pounds for it and now it's like you're going to get 10 minutes to look at that story and put the video out B- barry weiss obviously had um sounds like i'm saying barry white Barry, Barry Weiss, um, <laughs> very different people, um, obviously had an incentive, uh, as, as did her, is it Camelli? Um, Camelli, yeah. So, I mean, they, they, they have, a, well, he's, a, he's an independent guy. I think he's a businessman, but he also has his own podcast. Um, and he's just, he's kind of, um, he's an African-American who is sceptical of some of the current orthodoxy on um, anti-racism um, and so this is the kind of thing that interests him where he thinks the, the, the orthodoxy is kind of skewing the, the reporting of a story. So they collaborated on this. Now that their incentive is to, to, to run something that's counter to the mainstream narrative, right? So they also have their own kind of agenda, right? To use an overused word at the moment, but that's fine. I mean, that's, that's not something that like concealing, it's just something one should be aware of when, when, when you're interpreting what they have to say. Uh, but, but yeah, we, we really want journalists to be incentivized, uh, at least in part, by being really good journalists, <laughs> which I think involves, you know, being prepared to be a little bit more, more thorough uh, and, and more uh, sort of independent minded and uh, more thoughtful than, than uh, you know, the average tweeter.